Good afternoon, and welcome to uh, what hopes to be a, a, an interesting conversation with one of our nation's most prominent governors, uh, Governor Michelle Lujan uh, Grisham of New Mexico. Thank you for joining us today. The demands on you and other governors I know are rather extraordinary at this time during the COVID crisis, uh, and so we deeply appreciate the time that you're spending with us. Uh, governor uh, Grisham is the 32nd governor of the great state of New Mexico, the first Democratic Latina to be elected governor in U.S. history. She's had a very productive uh, couple of years in office. Uh, and in 2019, she oversaw one of the most productive uh, years uh, in state history, signing a broad package of bipartisan bills uh, uh, into law, notably a historic investment of public ed education and a landmark initiative and in transition to clean energy. So thank you. Uh, Governor Grisham. Uh, just a few introductory remarks uh, and then we'll get into the questions. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken hundreds uh, of thousands of lives, uh, sickened millions more and put life on hold for all Americans with especially harsh consequences for uh, communities of color and for families of uh, um, uh, dementia. The COVID pandemic has caused an alarming increase in deaths uh, of those experiencing Alzheimer's because in part, uh, this uh, disease attacks the neurons in the brain as well as the elements of your lungs and your heart and other elements of your body. It has also deprived family caregivers from the ability to uh, use daycare facilities for their loved one, to visit their loved ones in nursing homes and in, um, in assisted living facilities and to bring in daycare help into their homes in order to provide assistance in caring for those that are home. So we've been affected both by increasing the number of deaths in our community, as well as by the impact on the caregiver uh, loved one relationships. Uh, you memorably held up a photograph uh, of your mother uh, who lives in an assisted living facility in, uh, in Albuquerque. Um, uh, employing New Mexicans uh, to, uh, to socially distance and mask in order to protect older people uh, who are at high risk. Understandably so, since long care to long term care facilities across the country have seen a major increase uh, in uh, deaths uh, and a major source of outbreak. But Alzheimer's caregivers with loved ones in long term care report higher stress because they can't see their loved ones and importantly, uh, the health of their loved one and help with their care is less accessible than it was uh, before, uh, before COVID. So my first question is just a little bit about your background and about your experience with Alzheimer's, but how you as governor are beginning to try and balance this need for connectivity of families that are experiencing dementia and at the same time try to keep them safe. Well, uh, George, I really appreciate being invited to participate uh, with you all today. And you bet we are all against Alzheimer's and excited about your work and what you do. And I think that you framed it really effectively, which is a, a pandemic is a national global crisis of uh, the kind of proportions that we haven't seen in a hundred years. And so you have to start with there's no balancing, it is unfair. You have to recognize that if you don't get it under control, the kind of other consequences, including what we're seeing for both populations on either end of the spectrum. If you're in a long-term care facility or you're in a correctional uh, environment or you're a kid who can't go back to school, the social isolation and the inability to support the social well and mental well-being of uh, our populations has proven to be uh, an enormous challenge where you have to weigh, um, do we risk death by COVID, including to all the other residents and all the other workers, or do we risk having uh, uh, depression and isolation, which has led, I think, to uh, increased mortality rates and related exacerbated underlying conditions. And so I've had, uh, we've been a very strict follow the science uh, and we're a state that has one third less healthcare capacity. And that means that for per capita, we have less than any other state in the nation and yet we're poorer and sicker as a population than anyone else in the United States. So when I have an outbreak and we have at nursing homes, there aren't any other caregivers. 
right? So now we're in a situation like we saw with horror in Spain, where they abandoned nursing homes and went on to other vehicles to provide care and left people uh, to die, which is the most untenable, horrific set of circumstances that we're seeing play out. Quickly, like most states, we're trying to figure it out. Increased testing, rapid testing on site, outdoor visiting, uh, lots of window visiting, uh, uh, notebooks and iPads and any number of ways to make sure that you're doing video conferencing. And all of that is helpful, but there is nothing that replaces human touch and familial or loved one interaction, including in our safeguards like the Ombudsman program. And we are really struggling here like we are anywhere. And you talked about my mom. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been able to see my mother in person uh, since last December and she's not doing well and she's been to the hospital twice and I couldn't go with her to the hospital and she keeps getting quarantined and she can't wear a mask and she doesn't suffer from Alzheimer's but she does have dementia. She's got cognitive issues and she doesn't understand why she's abandoned and where I am and it is an incredibly devastating situation where I see my mother's health failing before my eyes because I can't get in there. And right before this conference, her physician called me to say she's not doing well again today. And we're gonna try to wrap around in some way. The answer to this issue is threefold. One, we have to have better uh, preventative strategies. We need fewer people in long-term care facilities. We need better strategies with backup for a pandemic for families who find themselves also without access to critical care. And three, as a country, we need to do much better at public health and infection control because the countries who got it under control aren't having these debates about social isolation for their vulnerable populations. We are, as Americans. Uh, I've crushed this virus in New Mexico twice, and now I have to do it again because there's a resurgence. So people won't wear masks, they won't socially distance, they won't protect those caregivers, uh, and that is a problem. And this is a country that needs public health and public health prevention education. Uh, I'm gonna tell you early, early childhood education all the way through the end of your education because we clearly don't understand how to manage it. And that really, in fact, is the answer. Well, I think there's no question that you're absolutely right. We speak of uh, the populations that have pre-existing conditions, uh, which are more vulnerable, or who are more vulnerable uh, to pandemics, this one, uh, but also to other pandemics. If in fact we could uh, strengthen ourselves by improving our health uh, of pre-existing conditions, namely chronic conditions, we'd be much stronger as a community in resisting pandemics. So you're Agreed. absolutely right. But Agreed. Let me, let, that what, what is interesting and what's challenging about this is that the pre-existing condition set, uh, the chronic condition set, uh, it disparately affects communities of color and low-income populations, uh, which means that our strategies have to be directed in particular, uh, not solely, but particular about improving uh, public health conditions, chronic conditions in low-income and communities of color. So I'm curious as to whether you view it that way, and if that's so, what you might be doing as governor to try and uh, mitigate these disparities that we're seeing uh, in, uh, in pre-existing conditions, chronic conditions, and hence vulnerability. I totally pay. agree with you. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I'll, I'll, I'll digress, I promise not, and be not as long-winded. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I like you. In, in this state, uh, a rural frontier state, one of the poorest states in the nation, uh, using old, antiquated, unfortunately, I can't change Medicare calculations, we don't have the resources here to build the kind of healthcare system not that the country does it very well, but we are in far uh, uh, worse shape. And yet we haven't overrun our hospitals, even though we're surging. Uh, we've done very well with our healthcare clinics. There's no out-of-pocket costs for testing or for COVID-related illnesses. Our insurance costs are coming down, our premiums on the exchange. Uh, and we have 43 plus percent of our population on Medicaid with the most robust set of Medicaid investments and benefits. Frankly, I, I still think of any other state in the country, 
Uh, and we are building that out all of the time, looking at public options and other ways to really build an effective healthcare system that is based on prevention on the front end. So if we weren't doing COVID well, and there was a New York Times article on, and we're surging right now. So if you're watching CNN, you can say that you can see that we're, we're struggling to keep the infection at bay. But our, our mortality rate, given that we're a minority majority state with the largest individual numbers of sovereign nations, Pueblos and tribes in the country, we, our mortality rate should have been much higher. Why wasn't it? Well, we did a lot of containment and a lot of good public health strategies on the front end. But we also know that if we don't get it right, it would be uh, much higher one in three adults in New Mexico suffers from high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease, uh, the most serious of those chronic consequences that make us more vulnerable to say H1N1, so those flus and to this particular virus. It is clear that we aren't doing the right preventative, preventative work and Medicare is shifting in that direction. Medicaid has to catch up and we must fight to make sure that we're te teaching and treating um, social determinants of health by population health in this country. And until we do, we're gonna spend far more on the back end, which means we aren't gonna be dealing with preventing Alzheimer's and dementia and applying curative measures, which I think are now in the pipeline. You know, this is a country that keeps catching up and we never had to be in this position to start with. And you are right, George, my mother's dementia is completely related to all of her other underlying conditions and bad public health choices on her part, including smoking. Well, as you know, we're in the brain health uh, business, so to speak, uh, in so singing the same song you are, uh, but as we think about how to build out greater capacity uh, in the health system uh, to be able to understand, detect and understand how to treat brain health issues, um, uh, at least neurological conditions in older populations, although we're beginning to work with the mental health community on younger populations. Mm -hmm. One of the critical things is how to build out a health care system that's better prepared uh, for brain health issues of aging populations. Uh, and so one of the strategies that we are considering is how to build greater capacity, both in terms of resource and in terms of uh, expertise and tools and tests into the community uh, healthcare system. So I'm curious as to what the quality and nature of your community healthcare system in uh, New Mexico and whether that is a strategy uh, which deals with an, a capillary of the general healthcare system, uh, which is more attuned to low income and people of color populations. New Mexico has a, has a lot more to do, but we do actually have a, uh, I think, a very effective community health uh, and more holistic healthcare system because we've had to do that given the rural and frontier nature. And you know, we've got some communities that have um, uh, very limited access to practitioners. So if we don't use an integrated private and community healthcare model, we have one of the most successful telemedicine, telehealth models in the country that has been now the focus of considerable both international and federal investments. And they are looking at Alzheimer's and related issues so that primary care practitioners who often are internists and geriatricians get even more support uh, and more education and training to think about ways to detect it early, diagnose it early, and to do the kind of preventative investments and in work that families families really need in order to both prepare and prevent to the highest degree that you can. And I feel really good about those efforts and investments, but none of it's enough. Although I might just point out that in my first legislative session, we invested in centers of excellence. Our bioscience center of excellence is in our uh, uh, one of our universities that's got our medical school, which is uh, an incredible medical school given the size and nature of the state. It's fantastic. And you know, UNM, the University of New Mexico is being credited as one of those research institutions that's in the market for doing the research to cure Alzheimer's and is listed as one of those institutions uh, that's in that race to productively get that over the finish line. Uh, and it's really exciting work. And I think states who suffer from 
more chronic conditions, more dementia, more cognitive impairments, more Alzheimer's uh, need to be in that leadership role because we can solve any number of these issues all across the country and all across the world. And something, George, I didn't say, Alzheimer's dementia is the cruelest disease. Uh, and it doesn't care who you are or where you are, how healthy you've been, although we know that there are uh, exacerbating and pre-existing uh, situations and conditions that create other problems and risks. But when you add that to COVID, I just want to make sure that everybody's hearing our conversation. Uh, this has been a very painful dynamic for everyone. And it is the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. And uh, I'm looking at newer strategies in addition to prevention and cures and treatments that would create cooperatives so that caregivers who make the lowest can own um, uh, in, uh, their own assisted livings and be in an environment or have collaborations with families so that we create a pipeline and wealth and equity for the men and women who are largely Hispanic in this country or minority populations who are providing uh, support to familial caregivers. And I know I'm preaching the choir, you know, more than $500 billion worth of care. And while my mom's on Medicaid, and thank God for that, and Medicare, I guess. Uh, help from any number of programs without my involvement, I assure you, she would cost the healthcare system more, she would not have lived this long, and she would not have any quality of life despite the loving attention people try to provide. It's not the same. I do it better. I'm more effective. And her doctor will tell you I'm better at diagnosing what's going on with her because I don't have to figure out her baseline. I know her. Yeah. Well, I, as, a, as a member, the reason I started this organization 10 years ago is because three generations of my family have been impacted by Alzheimer's at, over a 40-year period. And I thought that if, in fact, we didn't accelerate efforts and, and adopt new strategies and get more resources, uh, 40 years from now, the situation were the same. It's my kids and my grandkids. Of course, men are always in denial, but, uh, but it would be my kids and my doesn't grandkids. doesn't seem like you are, George. You're awesome. And I, <laughs> I, and I know we're running out of time, but I also want to pitch... Medicaid, Medicare, healthcare financing, making sure we don't miss an opportunity to deal with this. Absolutely. Also, if, if I, we I, don't, my organization don't is uh, my organization will be seeking more resource for community health centers and strategies in leading areas uh, to try and use community health centers. Uh, to really try and get at both the prevention uh, elements of this as we're seeking a national prevention strategy uh, as well as um, as well as improvements uh, across the nation. So we uh, will be back in touch, uh, Governor Luhan. Good, and let's expand Care Corps, which is uh, a, okay. a, a kind of a, a national Peace Corps replication strategy aimed at having more volunteers trained and supported never to replace paid uh, caregivers, right? You know, the, our men and women who dedicate their lives to making a difference, but it is a way to support families and the individuals who are uh, suffering and are losing independence and want us to treat them with dignity and respect. So I'm excited about that. Maybe we can work together on more funding and more support for that. And so let's do three things. Let's uh, attack this pandemic and solve it. Let's take care of our families and their loved ones who are in long-term care and at home. Let's cure Alzheimer's. Let's prevent Alzheimer's and chronic conditions. And let's create an environment where Americans are the healthiest uh, uh, of all populations in the world. And let's focus on a group that really needs us that will also, frankly, save the country. If we're worried about the federal deficit and the national debt, look no further than making sure we do something about our long-term care expenditures. Well, I, 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 the the only other thing I would say together is let's all vote. Uh, let's all let's vote. All vote. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's get uh, uh, an administration one way or the other. I'm not going to take a partisan view here, uh, but one way or another that will actually uh, take exactly your three priorities and go execute on. Thank you so much for your time, your insight, your comment, your energy. Uh, and I love your vision, and we will be partners in the future. I am confident. So you thank can count you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Take care.